Hi, this video is on multiplicative hashing. This is a universal hash family that we can use in our data structures, our hash tables. So the goal here is to define a universal hash family. What that means is we need a procedure that can be given a positive integer m. m is going to be the size of a hash table. And it can produce a random universal hash function. So that means a function that is given a key of some arbitrary key data type k and return an index in the range 0 through m minus 1. In practice, we break this down into two steps. There's a hash code step that takes the key of type k and maps it into an unsigned integer. And then there's a function h that takes a hash code, which is a non-negative integer, and maps it into an index in this range and also guarantees that collisions are unlikely. This video covers the hc part. So the previous video explained how to get hash codes. That's how to take an arbitrary key type and turn it into an unsigned integer. This video is going to explain how to take these non-negative integers and turn them into indices in this range. Remember that we need our hash function to have these two properties. The first one is it needs to be consistent. So if x and y are equal, then the hash of x has to equal the hash of y. That's so that if you store a key in a hash table at a certain location, you can hash the key and find the same location the next time. And we also need a rare collision property that means that if x and y are different keys, then the probability that the keys have the same hash code has to be small, namely that has to be less than or equal to 1 over m. So multiplicative hashing is one particular universal hashing scheme. It's not the only one, there are others. And multiplicative hashing is based on a couple ideas. It's based on a linear function like y equals mx plus b. That's a line equation in slope-intercept form. So you've probably seen these kind of linear equations where uh, for any x, you multiply x by a slope number and then add a b. The core of multiplicative hashing is a linear function like that. And then we also use modular arithmetic, which is the percent operator in C++. That's how we'll make sure that a really big integer maps down into a index 0 through m minus 1. The percent operator is a convenient way of doing that. Multiplicative hashing is similar to something called a linear congruential random number generator. That's one kind of random number generator, and it's often used to implement RAND. So the RAND function that you might have called before often generates random numbers in the same way that we generate indices here. So here it is. Given m, so m is given to us, that's chosen, and it's going to be the size of the vector, so it defines the range of outputs of our hash function. So given m, we need to pick three things. First, we need to pick a prime number p, and p has to be greater than or equal to m. In practice, often p is chosen to be a fixed constant number that's near the maximum value of an int. So a common choice is int max is 2 to the 32nd power minus 1. That's the maximum possible value of a signed 32-bit integer, and that actually happens to be a prime number. But anyway, this works for any large prime that's bigger than m. And then we make two random integer choices. You could call rand for these. We need a random integer a and another random integer b. And a has to be in the range 1 through p minus 1. b has to be in the range 0 through p minus 1. So once we've made those three decisions on prime p and two random ints a and b, we define our hash function to be the following. Hash of c is ac plus b mod p and then mod m. So putting that together, ac plus b is like the linear equation part. Given hash code c, we multiply c by our random int a, and then add our random int b. And so this is why every time we generate a new hash function, we'll pick a different a and b, and so we'll get different hash functions that do the mapping differently. But for a particular hash function, we fix a and b when we construct the hash function, and then they're locked in for the lifetime of that hash function. So ac plus b, that's the core. This generates a pretty big number. A is a random number 1 through P, and if P is like 2 billion something, then A is somewhere between 1 and 2 billion, so it's a pretty big number. And C is often also a large number. B is 0 through P, so also something in the billions perhaps. So big number times big number plus another big number makes a really big number. This is often a very large number. Mod P then divides that large integer by p and keeps the remainder. So that gives us a number 0 through p minus 1. And the reason why we mod p is a number theory thing that helps with making sure that every index is approximately equally likely. So after that mod, we have a number 0 through p minus 1. If p is huge, this is still a pretty big integer. 
and then mod m takes the remainder of dividing that large integer by m, so that's what produces a number 0 through m minus 1. This is convenient to implement because it's pretty fast and simple to program. You know, I've got a multiply and add and two mod operations, so you can code this up in one line of code using just a few arithmetic operations. The consistent property holds kind of automatically because this is a deterministic math equation. When we create H, we decide on a particular value of A, B, P, and M that are locked in. So every time you evaluate this for a given C, you're going to get the same number. What we still need to prove is the rare collision property. That one's a little bit more complicated. So before we get into a math proof of that, let me explain an intuition for why all of the outcomes are approximately equally likely. This works kind of like a roulette wheel. A roulette wheel is a kind of physical random number generator, and it's used in the game of roulette, like at a casino. So this is a picture of one of those. And the way that works is to generate a random outcome here, you push on this and it spins around a few times and ultimately comes to a halt, and we consider that to be a random outcome. Also, it's on the Wheel of Fortune game show, so same idea, there's this big wheel and you spin it and it spins around multiple times and ultimately stops at a random location. The Price is Right has one of these too. So kind of the idea is that if the wheel spins around multiple times, its final resting spot is unpredictable, and that works as a random outcome. You know, you could kind of cheat and just tap this and make it move one click over, but that's not allowed. You have to push it hard enough that it spins around at least a few times. And if you put some force on this so that it spins for a while, it's not humanly possible to predict where it's going to stop. So the same kind of intuition carries over to our multiplicative hash scheme. A, B, and C are large integers, so A, C plus B is a huge integer, and we ultimately take that mod M, and it's hard to predict where that's going to end in that range. So A, C plus B mod P, that's still a huge number. That kind of corresponds to how hard you push on this and make it spin around. If I did A, C plus B mod P, so that, that big integer, if I divide that by M, that's how many complete revolutions we make around the roulette wheel. And then if I take this big number and do mod M, that's how much force is left over after the last complete revolution. It's kind of like how many clicks are left over after the last complete spin. And that's an unpredictable amount, and it's likely to fall anywhere. All of the outcomes are equally likely to occur. Now let's see a more formal proof of this. So this part here uses some number theory. If you're not familiar with that, just kind of follow along as best you can. So a collision occurs when, for different keys x and y, the hash of x is equal to the hash of y. So in our system, where we're generating these with the linear equation ax plus b and ay plus b, a uh, collision happens when ax plus b is congruent to ay plus b plus some im mod p. So that means if I am doing mod p arithmetic on both sides here, if ax plus b gives us the same integer as ay plus b plus some im, where i is some integer in the range 0 through p, my, p minus 1 minus m. If this happens, then we have a collision. Now, uh, x is not equal to y, and that means that x minus y is not 0. You know, by assumption, these are different keys, and so they have a difference that's not 0. And that means that the difference x minus 1 has an inverse in modular arithmetic by p. So if we solve for a, so rewrite this equation in terms of a, then a is congruent to im times x minus y inverse mod p. Now, there are p minus 1 choices for a. Remember that p is an integer 1 through p minus 1. Uh, 0 is excluded. So there are p minus 1 choices for a. And for a fixed p, there is that p minus 1 over m and take the floor. That's the possible non-zero values for the right-hand side. So on the left-hand side, there are uh, p minus 1 possibilities. And on the right-hand side, there's this expression, non-zero values. And so the probability that a is equal, that the left-hand side is equal mod p, uh, is equal to the number of right-hand side values over the number of choices for p. And so if we take that fraction, it's this floor of p minus 1 over m over p minus 1. And then we can do some arithmetic here or algebra. If we drop the floor, that increases this fraction. So we drop the floor, this becomes a less than or equal to. And then we divide top and bottom by p minus 1, and we get 1 over m. 
So what that says is that for a fixed M and P and randomly chosen A and B, the probability of a hash collision is only 1 over M. And so our conclusion is that multiplicative hashing really is a universal hash family. It has both of the properties we need. It's consistent, and the probability of a collision is low. It's this 1 over M expression.